evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. Welcome back to another episode of Mahoning Drive-In Radio, the only podcast, as far as we know, dedicated completely to the love, history, and preservation of drive-in culture. I am joined today, well, first of all, I'm Mark, General Manager at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater in, as I like to say, Lehigh, Pennsylvania. And joining me today as a co-host is projectionist owner, Mahoning icon, Jeff. Say hello, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Excellent. <laughs> fellow fellow laugh-in fan. And joining us today to discuss the films contained within Exhumed Films and Mahoning Drive-In Theaters Saturday, August 12th, shot out a Canon, Canon Films 35mm Dusk to Dawn show is Mr. Canon himself, Austin Trunick, author of two books so far on the films of Canon Films, entitled The Canon Film Guide, Volume 1, 1980 to 1984, and The Canon Film Guide, Volume 2, 1985 to 1987, and I hear tell of a third volume in the way, in the way, on the way, in the works, a third volume coming, Austin Trunick. Welcome, Austin. Hey, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. I am so excited to get back out to the drive-in. I've had such a good time there last summer. Yes, you came out for the Canon Films trailer show that we did, and you, uh, if I'm recalling this correctly, and you vended, you vended yourself right out of all the books that you brought. Yes. Yeah. I ran <laughs> out that night. That was a, <laughs> I, I had actually talked to Paul Talbot, another Mahoning uh, guest veteran, um, author of the Bronson Blues books. And he advised me, he says, bring, bring uh, more books than you think. And I did. And it's, it wasn't enough. So <laughs> I'll have more books with me this time. I, I learned my lesson last summer. So for all of you who missed out on getting a signed copy of one of Austin's books, come on out on August 12th because he will have more. Now, what is the ETA? And I'm not pressing you. There's no pressure here. What is the ETA for volume three? Uh, it's a long ways off still. I am trying to temper expectations because this is a big book. It's a lot of movies. It's actually more movies than the other one because this is these were Canon's direct-to-video years, I like to call them, 88 up through the end of uh, in the mid-90s. And there, there are a lot of movies in here and a lot of ones that even I and I was not that familiar with before before writing them. But it's I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to wrap it up sometime late next year. So maybe Christmas 24 or early 25 is what I'm currently shooting for. And that's giving a very, <laughs> a very conservative estimate. That's hey, you know, why rush excellence? Uh, the first two books are hefty volumes as they are. So anybody who picks up the first two, just just savor the flavor of the canon film history of those years. And then by the time you're done, it'll it'll be time for volume three. So we're here to talk about the films that we will be screening, as I said, on August 12th at this Dusk Till Dawn 35 millimeter canon show. I've heard of these movies. I've seen, I think, two out of these four movies. But I know, honestly, nothing about what it took to make these movies. So Austin, you know, we're going to just, uh, I was saying to Jeff just before you came on, you are like Steven Seagal in Under Siege. We keep you and your intellect locked in like a meat locker or a freezer in the basement. And when it's time to unleash hell upon the, the canon ignorant, we just open that door and stand back. I don't know if that's the best analogy for what you do, but it, it's one I'm going to stick with. So, oh, I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> you're just going to you're just going to be doing that slappy fighting uh, knowledge laying down like nobody's business. So <laughs> the first film we're going to screen is one I've never seen. And I know it spawned this like insane, like canon legacy. This is American Ninja from 1985, starring Michael Dudikoff as the titular American Ninja. He is the only soldier. Who is he? Who is capable of defeating the secret Black Star Army. A soldier who has become a master ninja. Your destiny, my son, awaits you. The deadliest art of the Orient is now in the hands of an American. American Ninja. Starts Friday, September 20th. Consult your local listing. Had Dudikoff done much before this? Because I always just associate him with this film series. He had done a little bit. And what's interesting about this this franchise, and this, in particular the first American Ninja movie, is that it turned him into an action star. It really changed his, the trajectory of his career. He was a 
comic actor for the most part. He is best known um, before this film for Bachelor Party with Tom Hanks. He was he was in that movie. He was on a sitcom. He had been he had a recurring guest role on Happy Days. So he was mostly known for you know, small parts, but comic roles. And this was a movie he went out for. He went out for the audition and he almost walked away from it because there was a really long line and they had the people in there kind of showing that they could do moves that looked like martial arts, even if they didn't know martial arts, if they could convincingly punch and kick and things like that. And he almost walked away st standing in line just because it was it was long and he didn't consider himself. He didn't think of himself an, as an action star, but he got in there and Mike Stone liked his look, the the uh, martial artist who had choreographed this movie and worked on quite a few of the ninja films for canon. And who I'll and, always point out stole Priscilla Presley away from Elvis. Just <laughs> Yes, yes. The, his other claim to fame introduced canon to ninjas and stole Elvis's wife. Yeah, he, gosh, he he, he got Michael in there and um, director Sam Furstenberg liked his, liked his look. He kind of thought he looked like James Dean. I don't know how much I agree with that, but that's what he thought. And he got the role. And... It launched a franchise and it launched a homegrown action star for canon. Michael Dudikoff became primarily known for action films from that point on. It's so funny because I never thought of him as, uh, well, I, I guess I would never realize that he was a comedic actor. I was, he was, he's the canon action guy. So it's funny to think that much like Joe Piscopo's career could have gone if he had pursued, you know, the action fully, uh, just uh, a comedic guy. So this was a theatrical release in 85, right? Yes. Where all the films, I mean, we're jumping way ahead in the history of American Ninja, but there were, were there five or more of these films when all was said and done? There were five American Ninja movies, and Canon had done three Ninja movies before that with a Shogasugi. And this was originally intended to be, Ameri this, was, this was going to be Ninja 4. So this was going to follow Ninja 3, The Domination, a wonderful movie you guys screened last year. Right. Uh, had a great crowd reaction. This was going to be Ninja 4 for a while, and because Shokasugi left, they kind of decided to start fresh with a new series, so it became American Ninja. And yeah, there were there were four, I would say, actual full American Ninja movies. American Ninja 5 went to rect a video, and it is only an American Ninja in in title <laughs> title alone. It's it was an it was developed as an entirely different movie and they they called it american ninja 5 to to sell them a few more copies to video stores so these films i see i lived in a small town when these films were coming out so a number of them did play my local multiplex but i don't remember seeing ads even in the larger city papers for some of the the middle to late period american ninja films did they get wide national u.s releases or were they more regional do you do you know that the well, the second one got a pretty darn good release, but the third and fourth were smaller and smaller. Those were movies that came when Canon was really in the midst of their biggest financial troubles. So the the size of the theatrical releases shrunk. These were more about the international sales that they had already collected the money for and getting them into video stores as quickly as possible. So there were a lot of cases where with the later American Ninja movies where you would have it in your video store and then your cheap theater would get it. Or many times it was a drive it. Like if a drive in picked up one of Canon's bigger movies, it would be the second movie kind of sent along as the, as the B film you would get what the, the new Chuck Norris and then American Ninja three as your, as your second showing movie. Looking back from where I'm sitting right now, it's a pretty fun double feature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a, a, a canon double feature, even a canon B movie, as we said before we started recording, good or bad, how you view these films, they knew how to make an entertaining movie. You know, they were like almost calculatedly entertaining. And uh, even the bad ones are just like, they're never boring, you know? No, no. I, I've said this before, but you rarely find a, tr I'm making bunny ears quotes here, a traditionally good uh, film in the canon library, but you'll you'll have a hard time finding one that's not entertaining so speaking of entertaining the uh, second film we're showing that night 
is we first ran this on film uh, as, you know, I would say strangely pristine copy, but then I think this movie really didn't get a lot of play in its day, uh, it, or at least it didn't get a lot of play after it came out. 1987's Masters of the Universe. A battle fought in the stars now comes to Earth. Police, how many move? I'm gonna need some backup. A battle for the power. To be masters of the universe. Dolph Lundgren is He-Man. Frank Langella is Skeletor. Let this be our final battle! Masters of the Universe, rated PG. Now playing at a theater near you. We originally played this as part of what we called Second Chance Weekend for films that originally kind of had failed or weren't critical successes, and we paired it with Howard the Duck. And both, again, strangely or not, just pristine prints that we ran that night so i'm guessing that's what we're getting again how did masters of the universe came to be I, I remember hearing some things about reasons why things are so different in this and this is a masters of the universe he-man movie that's really bears very little resemblance to how the characters or the world of he-man looked in the cartoon yes well, this was a movie that actually was in development for almost five years before canon finally got hold of it and put it out but mattel it it came independently through Mattel, who recruited uh, producer Ed Pressman, who recently passed away, but is very prolific producer, but best known for, I, I, I would think, for the Conan the Barbarian movies. So he was developing it with Mattel. He attached Dolph. He attached uh, the director, Gary Goddard. And they were shopping around. This is, a, this is a film that also had the script by David O'Dell, who wrote The Dark Crystal. So it's an interesting bunch of talent behind it. But Mattel's reason was they had this toy line and had a cartoon and the toy line was doing great. The Master Universe toys, He-Man. I grew up watching He-Man on TV and they thought what could push it to the next level and kind of keep those toy sales going would be a live action movie. They were looking, I think, a lot at the toys, this the toys that were produced out of Star Wars, the small action figures. And to compete, they they tried to make this big budget live action movie and they shopped around at studios and it's funny to think this as we're here talking during a summer when the biggest one of the biggest new release movies this summer is going to be barbie another mattel property but back then people thought of making a movie out of a toy was absolutely ridiculous studio heads all the big studios turned them down was this the first movie based on a toy I, it's one of the first. It, it would to have be very, to be because when you say that, yeah, I think about it now. And we've had a GI Joe movie and any kind of intellectual property that anybody has heard of, whether it's a, a you know a, a board game or a movie, a, a theme park ride or a greeting card series turns into a movie. But back then, it really wasn't as common for live action. No, no, not at all. And and that was really hurt them at that point because they had this whole package put together and and nobody nobody wanted it. And it eventually came to Canon, it came down to Canon and another studio and, and Canon outbid the other studio by a slight amount, but it was still about only half of what they wanted to make the movie, what they thought they needed to make, to do it justice, this, this the vision they had at Mattel for it. But it also came very late. This was at a time when the cartoon was losing popularity. A lot of the boys young boys who had been buying the action figures in 1982 were starting to grow out of them so those cards were kind of stacked against mattel and ed pressman and canon at that point because they were working with a property that was no longer as hot as it had been had they actually been able to get the project really moving several years before and then by the time the film came out the the cartoon the cartoon had actually ended its run and the toy line had only produced one more set of action figures inspired by the the toy inspired by the movie and ceased production so we got the big screen live action he-man movie during the very last gasps of he-man's popularity as as the show had been canceled and, along with the toy line. I feel like I remember seeing ads, full page ads on the back of comic books for this. Right mm -hmm. around the same time, I was seeing full page ads on the back of comic books or in the comic books for Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Am I, am I wrong in that the releases were, the same, was it the same year? You're correct. They're both summer of 87. And there were two movies that as a kid I had zero interest in. 
<laughs> and I had been a big Superman fan. I loved the first three as a kid. And for whatever reason, when four came out, it just felt like it was, I, this all ties into what you just said about He-Man. At the time for me, it felt like it, the time had passed for that. And right. for He-Man, apparently it, it was too. I didn't realize it was after the cartoon was off. I just remember thinking that it was the, sort of the last thing I remember being a He-Man thing around that time. Right, right. It had really come at the at the end for for He Man, and rather than being what Mattel had hoped, the the thing that would kind of revitalize interest and you know spawn a new you know new le new generation and next age of fans, it kind of put the nail in the coffin for it for a few years. There were they, they, He Man, of course, came back, and they you know, they keep relaunching and keep bringing toys and. But for a while after this movie, there there was no new He-Man stuff for years. And the storyline is not what you would think of as a typical He-Man adventure on whatever planet he was on and all this. It was it was what I always thought of as a kid. Even I could see this. If there was a time travel movie or a space movie and they come from somewhere really exotic to Earth in the present day, that's cheaping out. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. They're good. They've come to modern day Los Angeles where we can just point the camera outside. And that's kind of what this movie did. It is. It is. And that was a cost cutting move once they realized that studios weren't going to give them the money. And once they realized that they had to do this with Canon, who at that point were just hemorrhaging money, they set it mostly on Earth in a uh, California suburb. Uh, so that would be a nice, easy commute, even from from Hollywood, from Los Angeles, for these the cast and crew. So they could save money on gas, basically. Yes, and the 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 one thing they get around it because this the movie it does have some things really that really go well for it, and I think they kind of spent their budget in a smart way by setting beginning and ending the movie in in the Castle Grayskull in Skeletor's throne room. And it was at the time, the largest largest indoor set that had been built in Hollywood, I think since the fifties, since the old Cinemascope, you know, Technicolor right. days. And it was a huge, just one set. I mean, the rest, the rest of the movie is cheaping out, but there is one big, beautiful, gorgeous set you see at the beginning and end of the film. And it's amazing what something just a funny bit of trivia, but the as they were shooting the Skeletor scenes on the next section over and the say the next soundstage right next door, Michael Jackson was shooting the Smooth Criminal video, and he man the He Man crew got to go watch him do the lean and everything. For Are that there any shooting. pictures of Michael Jackson or with Skeletor or He Man? <laughs> Not that I've seen. I. I, I hope. I hope they exist somewhere in somebody's archive. You'd think he'd want to do that. I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I, I'd be shocked if Michael Jackson didn't get a photo sitting in Skeletor's throne, holding holding the holding the sword of power. <laughs> Amazing. So the film came out. Do you, how what was the the success of this? Because I remember it being advertised on TV and I remember it playing in theaters, but I don't remember I just sort of remember the fact that it came out and then it was on video. It was disappointing, uh, to say the least. They spent a lot of marketing. They spent, I mean, it has a beautiful Drew Struzan poster um, art, which was rare for Canon to really splurge on a an artist of that caliber to to do their poster. But it was disappointing. But it's this came at a time where Canon was running out of money they they they're very um a story that I, I tell in the books and in more detail but they literally ran out of money at the end of shooting this before they were able to finish the film but canon had to send a guy to go there and literally pull the plug shut off the power to the soundstage where they were filming at midnight because they couldn't afford to keep shooting wow so there's if if you get to the end of the film and I don't want to spell too much, but there's a fight, but the fight is filmed in a dark room with a color wheel and a little bit of fog. That's not so much a style choice. That's a choice that is based on they're shooting in a dark room with a color wheel because everything's running on an extension cord and there's only like four or five people left in the crew who are working for free at that point to to actually finish the film. Wow. No. Wow. 
was there ever any interest in canon d probably doesn't make sense financially but of doing a follow-up to this or did they just basically say it was expensive it didn't do well we're moving on well there was not much interest on mattel's part but canon was interested they they announced a masters of the universe 2 at Cannes that year before this came out when Dolph was present they had a champagne uh, reception <laughs> for for Masters of the Universe which I I smile thinking about but Dolph at that point did not did not want to do the film he was embarrassed by it he did not want to do a second one so he kind of gritted his teeth as as Menachem was making the announcement but they went as far as actually starting to build sets and cast this was the sequel Masters of the Universe 2 was going to be Directed by Albert Pune, who oh, wow. sadly we we who just passed away uh, late last year, but it was going to feature Dolph wasn't going to be in there. Um, it was going to have the surfer Laird Hamilton taking over the He-Man role, hmm. and because this one was even cheaper, the whole idea is that He-Man has come to Earth and disguised himself as a, a football player, as a quarterback, and is kind of fending off a, an invasion in, in his disguise. It was, they used, they were used, gonna use every excuse they could not to, not to show the he man -y stuff, the stuff you expect, the aliens, the foreign planets and things like that. If you felt the first movie was cheaping out, it was going to go, take that even, take that a step further in the second one. The most un-He-Man, He-Man -He -Man movie imaginable. <laughs> right, and they took it, the, the movie actually, they got as far as being ready to shoot it. They were going to shoot it back to back with their Spider-Man movie that they had been working on for years and years. But when they decided that making those two movies would be too expensive, they canceled them. They had a lot of the crew were there. The costumes were already in place. Sets had been built for Spider-Man and they repurposed them. They turned those into the movie Cyborg. So <laughs> if you watch the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, 1989 Cyborg, you'll see that the bad guys are wearing the costumes from the first he-man movie you'll a lot of the cast members a lot of the bad guys a lot of the side characters in that film are played by people who had been cast by he-man had traveled out there to be in he-man only to have it canceled and just to make use of them and so so cyborg was the what they what they came up with really fast to kind of collect on the sunk costs they had on he-man 2 and spider-man that's amazing i had no idea that I, I mean i was asking just out of out of the blue sky if there was <laughs> any idea that there'd be a he-man 2 and you're like oh yeah they were just about ready to pull the literally pull the trigger on the camera to make the film pass through it that's that yeah they were amazing. just just weeks a couple weeks away from from starting shooting on he-man 2 and the, the cast for Masters of the Universe is not bad. I mean, you've got Frank Langella, who's a very respected actor, you know, buried under makeup, which is not terrible makeup. It doesn't really look like the Skeletor of the, the, the toy or the cartoon, but it's a pretty cool, creepy looking Skeletor. And um, I'm blanking on her name right now is Evil Lynn. Oh, Meg, Meg Foster. Foster. Meg Foster with those eyes. Oh. That's Evil Lynn. So you yeah. had, you know, good talent there, just <laughs> not the most dynamic film of all time, I guess. No, I, I don't know if... If you've ever had something as blue on the drive-in screen as as Meg Foster's eyes will, are when when you show this movie, because yeah, but it's a that's great a, cast. <laughs> that's a color palette term. Nobody has taken advantage of that. No like cinephile <laughs> has ever produced like a nail polish or a, or a or a, a shoe or something with you know Meg Foster's eyes blue. <laughs> it's one of the, they pet. I don't know who that comes up with the the Pantone colors, but when they have the new color of the year, they should they should look into that. The Eyes of Foster, uh, not, not <laughs> Foster Brooks. Uh, so the next film we're, we'll be discussing here is a film that we talked about a little bit when we were talking about Ninja 3 because it shares a star. And this is 1984's Breakin'. Breakin' and the just don't stop. Here comes the movie that's fresh and hot with high energy. Dancing to the beat with a scratch beat sound that comes from the street. This movie is unique. Don't be mistaken, you've got to see Breaking. Breaking, rated PG, starts Friday, May 4th. I noticed uh, I was watching, it was one of the Death Wish movies. Was it Death Wish 4? There's a scene where Bronson goes into 
bust some bad guys in the back of a video store and they're just posters for all canon films all over the walls. <laughs> and I believe Breakin is one of them. I'm take I've totally taken out of the movie at that point because I kept freeze framing going, I can identify that movie and that movie. And why is there five posters for Breakin in this room? So 1984 is Breakin. Yes, yes, the, you're right. In Death Wish 4, that scene is actually shot in the canon offices to, <laughs> to save money. Um, and so they decorated it with the movie posters they had around. It's all, it's a lot of canon canon advertising in death wish for um <laughs> but i what i like is in those that all those movies exist within the world of paul kersey at that point paul kersey could have seen breakin <laughs> i would like to think he did more than once breakin breakin was the one of the two biggest hits that canon ever had the most profitable movies it was number one for quite a while in the u.s and it is a movie that came about in a stupendously canon fashion. Menachem Golan's daughter was walking along Venice Beach and saw break dancers and was pointed them out to her father. And he thought, let's make a movie about it. So I hear this story there from from people who worked in the canon offices, but Menachem's walking up the up and down the up and down the aisles through through all the offices shouting who can write who can write a breakdancing movie who can write a breakdancing movie so that's that's how the movie began the movie from the time that that day where Menachem Golan finds out that breakdancers are a thing that exists to it being in theaters was less than 12 weeks oh my it's, god it's it's it would incredible the movie was playing in in may it's it was written in no time at all shot they Canon did something that worked really well for them as they actually just went down to Los Angeles and started recruiting break dancers. Who are your best break dancers? Who are your best rappers? Things like that. Who are your DJs and things like that? Let's, let's get them to be in their movie. So a lot of it is these are authentic people who were well known in the community of, of break dancing, which really works in the movie's favor. You have Boogaloo Shrimp and Shabadoo, two, <laughs> two of the most if the closest things to a household name when it comes to comes to break dancers but this there, there there's a story that again i love that that year at the Cannes film festival 84 the movie was number number one at the time in may may of 1984 so they're over in france and menachem is taking a meeting with andre zulowski the director of possession and several other very highbrow, very non-canon-like movies. And he he wants him, he's trying to talk him into shooting a Brooke Shields movie for him and shooting it so that it'll come out that August. And Andre is saying, I can't do that. No one, no one can shoot a movie in 12 weeks. And Menachem slaps his hand on the desk and points at a poster he has hanging up of Breakin. He says, that movie... I had that movie idea movie 12 weeks ago. Now it's the number one movie in America. You can shoot a Brooke Shields movie in 12 weeks. <laughs> so it's just, it's again, that's, yeah. it's just one of those things that gosh. So what I, was the period of time it took to shoot it? Because I mean, you said from the idea to the release, I mean, between the idea and shooting, there's a little time and between shooting there's post and prints and releases. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it shot in a week, two weeks? It was just, I believe, four weeks they shot the movie in, they wrote cast and printed it. The reason why it was moving so fast is because Beat Street, another studio was already working, had been working on for some time, Orion. It was Orion who was working on Beat Street and Menachem found out about it, you know, about a week into, into you know, the uh, developing breaking breaking and he then pushes the de the the release date up he pushes their whole calendar up because he is wanting to beat beat street <laughs> to to theaters so he had a very he, he he had a reason to rush them he wanted to be the first breakdance movie into theaters cuz he didn't think anybody would want to go see a second one and i think that was the case this was a number one movie for a while and the soundtrack blew up it you know it got a lot of coverage for canon and beat street kind of while arguably being a better made movie was it was it was the second to come it was 
it was not able to really match the excitement for breakdance and that Breakin did. And that was a genre that didn't really spawn more than a handful of movies, from what I recall. You had Breakin and Breakin 2, one of the most quoted film titles of all time or or paraphrased film titles of all time, and Beat Street. And I, I off the top of my head, can't think of too many more than that. Was Body Rock? That was another one, I think, that came out around the same time. The mm-hmm. Lorenzo Lamas uh, breakdancing movie. <laughs> it really was quite a flash in the pan kind of fad. And we, we talked about this before. Breaking 2 came out the same year, didn't it? Yes. Seven months almost to the day after Breaking was released. So both of those movies were made very quickly. And <laughs> Canon, Canon wanted to cash in. And <laughs> Breaking 2 made less than half of what Breakin' did. And it's just, it's amazing that it made that much. <laughs> just thinking in 1984, the, you had no shortage of breakdance films. Pro, you were probably at the, the market was saturated with breakdance films. Yet, yet Breakin' 2 still did, did all right. It's, it's and, you know, and its title lives on. Its title yes. is referenced in our culture more often than you'd think a breakdancing film title would be. Uh, it's just one of those things that people reference it all the time, probably that, which have never seen the film. Yeah, that's the that's has to be the biggest part of the break in legacy is that it added electric boogaloo to our lexicon. <laughs> so the, the the final film we have to discuss, the final film that the bleary eyed viewers will see at the uh, <laughs> shot out a cannon show is a film I've never heard of. And I've always heard spoken of in tones of the Bronson filmography and people going that one goes to some dark places. This is Kinjite Forbidden Subjects. For kids with nowhere else to go, the streets are the last stop. One cop is determined to make a difference. Hey, uh, I'm going to put you out of business. What are you, completely crazy? The worst kind of crime needs the hardest kind of cop. Charles Bronson. That's justice. Kinjite, Forbidden Subjects, Reddit R. Starts Friday at a theater near you. Yes, that's 1989. Yes, you are absolutely correct. This is a dark, dark Bronson film about child trafficking. So just a just a word of warning, but it is very much a Charles Bronson movie outside of the the kind of what the what the villains do in it. And it was the last Charles Bronson movie with Canon. And this was after they made many, many films together. I was going to say, I, this way, I remember this being sort of late in his tenure there. Right. He actually, after making this movie, kind of went into a mini retirement that only lasted a couple years. He ended up coming back for a short burst of movies in the mid-90s. But for a while, this was, yeah, it was his swan song. What's the story behind this film? Um, I Again, I don't know much about it. The, the director, the writer, uh, how it came to be. I remember it getting a theatrical release, and I remember seeing it on the video store shelves. So I knew it, it wasn't it wasn't like Death Wish 5 that was more or less a straight-to-video thing. Right. This this did have a that theatrical release. It was a film that actually was brought to canon through Bronson's agent, Poncho Koner, and... It came from a script by Harold Nebenzahl, who was a third generation film producer, a German born, um, mostly novelist, screenwriter and movie producer. What's amazing is this is the 1980s and he was a third generation film producer. And to have a third generation at that point, you can tell how how far his his time in in, in an industry goes back because he was not a young man he had been working since the 50s his grandfather was actually the co-founder of nero film the studio behind films like pandora's box fritz lang's m and his father after fleeing germany uh ahead of world war ii ended up coming to the united states buying a poverty row studio producers releasing corp where he yeah he was he was the head of Producers Releasing Corp, where he produced works by many of his other fellow notable European expats at that time who were 
really getting their first work in Hollywood. The Douglas Sirk made movies for him, Edgar Almer. He launched the career of um, Billy Wilder, one of his first film credits by financing People on Sunday in the 1930s. And his, of course, Harold would follow in his father's and grandfather's footsteps. He had gone into, served in the Marine Corps in World War II, and then came back and worked for MGM, mostly as somebody who was kind of a liaison for their product foreign productions but he did um he did have credits he was a producer on cabaret on ingmar bourbon's the serpent's egg billy wilder's fedora so he had done all these things before he got into screenwriting and wrote what is arguably charles bronson's sleaziest movie and he and he this is the man you know who started in 10 to midnight so that that's pretty cool yes yes this is a movie that actually, though, it came out, it, it went into production during the writer strike of 1988. We're just like what we're living through right now. But it meant that Harold Nebenzal was not available to make edits that Canon needed. So the director and Bronson's agent and Bronson himself all sort of rewrote it rewrote added scenes. So the, the original script for this movie doesn't have quite as much action. But thanks to the other people other than the screenwriter writing action scenes for Bronson, we do get a, a magical moment such as when a stuntman standing in for 68-year-old Charles Bronson is hanging off a crane, shooting gang members with one hand and hanging onto the crane with the other. I can't wait to see this. This is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There is too. I, I won't spoil anything here because it deals with the movie's ending. But if anybody wants to come talk to me at 4.30 a.m. or whatever time this movie's wrapping up on on the early hours of August 13th, I can tell you how they changed the ending and what the original ending was meant to be because it's drastically different than what they'll see at the drive-in. Oh boy, I'll, I'll absolutely do that. I'm in it to win it for this show. I've, I've <laughs> never really seen... Well, I've seen, I think, Breakin' was probably the only one I've ever watched all the way through. Masters of the Universe, you think, when I was a kid. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this show uh, and looking forward to having you out again, getting to see you in person. Most of our dealings are, you know, through the Internet or through a microphone like this. And oh. uh, having you're going to I believe you're going to do inter, inch, you're going to do introductions for the films before each film to give everybody a little bit of information and context. Uh, and if you're not, I just said it to the world. Well, guess what? You're doing. <laughs> I am so excited. That was that was the one of the peaks of 2022 for me. So I can't wait to be back oh, in the projection booth and speaking to the microphone. Absolutely. And so so that's what we're going to show on August 12th for their Shot Out of Cannon show. Tickets are available at MahoningDIT.com. But before we go, I want to put you on the spot in two ways. Uh -oh. There's two things I didn't mm. I didn't even say I was going to ask you about. Uh oh, OK. So, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, it's easy. So there are two documentaries about Canon films. There is Electric Boogaloo and there is uh, produced by uh, Menahem Golan, I believe himself, The Go-Go Boys. Uh, I trust you've seen both of these documentaries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, which do you like better? Well, I'm going to cheat here. They are, <laughs> they're both great. They both kind of, so, so Electric Boogaloo probably gives you a bigger picture of what Canon was. And it gives a lot of people talking about them. A lot of people who had bad experiences sharing those. Go, go boys is your much more, more um positive they authorized they, story. yes yes but gogo -Go boys has a lot of wonderful footage a lot of great archival stuff a lot of interviews with menachem and yoram themselves that were not they were not involved they were not involved with electric boogaloo because when they found out it was being made they decided to make their own <laughs> that's the canon way yes I'm so, sure they were hoping I, to get it out there first too Ah, yes. Yeah. They, they just wanted to beat it. They got to beat beat street. That's, that's how it goes, <laughs> but they're both, I, I think they're both essential. And I tell people before you, before you read my books, you really should check out both of those, both of those movies. Electric Boogaloo is so entertaining, so well put together and so funny. There are some hilarious stories in there. And then you, the, the Google boys has some great, great access to some documentary footage and archival footage that's, is also absolutely worth seeing. So you can actually see what what it looked like as the as Golden Globus were kind of working and what the offices and how chaotic they were. 
See, I, I felt the same way, which is not to say this is a trick question, but some people say, you know, Electric Boogaloo is the way to go. Go, go, boys isn't as good. And I thought they were they were like two puzzle pieces that interlock. There's some overlapping uh, of what the, of content, but they each have things the other doesn't. And it is really interesting to see mm -hmm. the canon story from the guys who were canon themselves and to see them now. Mm -hmm. To talk about how they had a falling out and to see them, you know, in the same space at the same time again, which was kind of that, dramatically very interesting and touching. Yeah, there, there, are, there are moments in the Go Go Boys that <laughs> bring bring tears to my eyes almost because they are. It is, it is a story of these two cousins who were inseparable, started this empire, had a falling out, and were brought together again for a final time by this this documentary and these two old men kind of watching through there, there's a great great moment in there where they're sitting in a screening room watching clips from all of their old movies and kind of just taking a trip down memory lane it's it is it is a very beautiful moment and 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 like you can't see the forbidden dance without seeing lombada and vice versa mm -hmm. that's how i feel about these documentaries you do need to you, you should check them out both of them I would like to hope that in your daily life, you do use that analogy from time to time saying, you know, <laughs> chocolate and peanut butter. It's like Lombada and, and the forbidden dance. You got to have you got to have them both together. Anytime I sit down to have a serious talk with my kids, there's a good chance that I, I will make a reference to Lombada or the forbidden dance. Bless you, sir. <laughs> the other question I had was if you were to program your own canon dust till dawn show and i edit this show so you can take as much time as you want if you could program your own canon dust till dawn show regardless of print availability if you were just going to pick four titles that you feel represent canon films and they can be some of the ones we've got here too uh, what would those four titles be and in what order wow that's tough that's tough i am actually going to steer clear because you've shown some of the ones that would belong in there so i will kind of push those to the side because I know you you showed um Texas Texas 2 was as one of your Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 was one of your Tunnel Vision Tuesdays I believe earlier this year correct and then the Apple was wonderful last year I, I came I made the drive out for that I wasn't going to miss seeing the Apple on a drive-in screen and but boy out of ones you guys haven't shown yet that's my own I know you didn't give me that Give, give me that parameter, but I'm, I'm going to go okay. with that. I will say we have to put Revenge of the Ninja in there. That is a just a great, alongside Ninja 3 and American Ninja, the best, one of the best, and my personal favorite. That's if, if somebody were to force me to pick my number one favorite canon movie, Revenge of the Ninja would have been in there. I would say Invasion USA. It's my favorite of the Chuck Norris uh, canon features. It's just nonstop Chuck Norris action. Um, <laughs> very little <laughs> plot, very little acting or serious. There, there's there's not really a romance subplot for Chuck to stumble through. It's just it's just him shooting people, hanging off the side of a truck and bursting through like the the glass doors of a mall, wearing denim just more denim than any human being can wear on one body at a time. It's a film that just plays great when viewed through a windshield. Uh, I mean, not, <laughs> yes. not while flying through a windshield because then you probably can't see anything, but I mean, sitting in a car at a drive-in certain movies are just like, this just mean it needs to be at a drive-in. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see. So we have revenge what? of the ninja mm -hmm. followed by invasion USA. You have, Two more selections. Two more. Well, okay. I'm gonna piggyback here. I'm gonna say Break in Two. Um, Break in nice. Two is a a film that didn't do as well as Break in, but in the terms of like in the sense of canon craziness, it's it's wild. It, it takes whatever little bit of uh, amount of being grounded in reality the first movie was and does away with it. This is a movie where break dancing break dancing brings brings a dead man back to life where cars stop start bouncing it's 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 like an old an old musical where everybody you know everybody in the movie is break dancing at at different points it's just well, it, and magic. i always thought that even when i was a kid the basic plot of this is they're trying to 
band together to save the community center, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like an old Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland musical. It's got that great. Yeah, let's 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 save the day with dance and song. It's that's really what it is. And wow, I have one left. One left. Boy. Alternatively, it's like we put you in a space capsule and we're firing you out <laughs> into the cosmos and you're only equipped with a four disc <laughs> changer. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, well, that's different because it's like, what films do you want to be driven slowly insane by as you run out of air? So maybe just let's just keep it to the idea that you're at a drive. OK, let's go with the drive. And and so, yeah, there's there's two that I'm thinking of. If I'm going with the crowd pleaser. And something that would not be just my my own very selfish personal pick. A, a movie I do I do love, and I think a lot of other people also love. But probably Bloodsport. And in terms of what might actually <laughs> sell tickets, it would. It, a lot more people I think would be interested in seeing Bloodsport than what my other pick would have been the Norman Mailer directed Norman Mailer adaptation, Tough Guys Don't Dance, which is just a personal quirky favorite of mine out of the Canon Library. I've still never seen that. That's one of those films that when you think canon films, you just think of action and comedy and wild and woolly. And But sandwiched in there, like we were talking before we started, you have movies like Runaway Train and yeah. Tough Guys Don't Dance and, and movies that were attempts at being prestige pictures. This this is a company that produced you know, eight, eight ninja movies, more Chuck Norris and Charles Bronson movies than most people probably know existed but they also made movies by robert altman franco zeffirelli jean-luc godard just all of these incredible very well-respected names found themselves john cassavetes found themselves part of the canon family for <laughs> one brief period in their career and how long was canon in existence from the from the point of what the apple was the first release right yeah, the Apple was the, really their first. That was their coming out party. The with under the under the um, leadership of Golden Globus, Canon was a company that existed, um, was founded by other people in the '60s. But they, when we think of Canon, when most people discuss Canon, they're looking at the the 1980 onward period. But 1980 through 1994. Wow, so that's it's yeah. it's such an impressive accomplishment. When you see what essentially, I mean, it was more than two guys, but at, at its heart, it was two guys just cranking out all these movies that so, so many people still talk about and love. And that was just like, in many ways, more iconic a studio than some of the major studios were during that period. Um, it, it's You can laugh at the films and say, haha, cheap canon films, but we're still talking about them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. These, these are movies, if you, like myself, grew up, you know, fell in love with movies at the video store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's my origin story. You, you couldn't escape them, but there are, there are people who also, they saw their movies based on what was on, on cable all the time. And Canon right. was also what you could count on one of your cable movie channels, 24 hour movie channels. If you turned it on at 2 a.m., there would be a Canon movie. If you turn it on at 7 a.m., there would be a Canon movie on one of those channels. They were inescapable. They they were a, a powerhouse. Uh, Jeff, did you have any questions for Austin? No, this has been a great interview. I loved learning. Uh, can't really think of a thing at the moment. It was great. I, I'm sort of the same way when we do these chats. Like I, I don't have a lot to add to it. I just I just wanted just to hear all these stories. And I have yeah. the books. Just so you know, I'm not looking to get all this information for free. There's a lot more information in the books <laughs> than here. We just let you know to have the ability to expound and, and delve into things and explore things a little bit more with the voice than we do on the page. But uh, those those two books sit proudly on my shelf. I cannot wait for the third one. I cannot wait for you to join us on August 12th at Shot Out a Cannon. I hope it does well enough so that we just can keep doing these things uh, because th there's so many movies and they're so fun. And uh, I love having these chats, you know? Oh, I I... This is a blast, and I, I can't wait to get out there again. I, I've told people this anytime I, I talk about them honing. I, I tell them there's there's really not a more fun place to, to watch movies under the stars. It's 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 a magical little piece of land out there in the middle <laughs> of Pennsylvania. Thank you. That's great. 
Uh, thank you so much. You know, we we put on the kind of shows we want to see, maybe selfishly, yeah. and then charge other people for the privilege of joining us to watch them. Uh, so we will see you and you who are listening, hopefully, on August 12th at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater in Lehighton, Pennsylvania, for Exhumed Films and the Mahoning's presentation of Shot Out a Cannon, a four-film, <laughs> canon-filmed, 35-millimeter, Dust Till Dawn show. We hope Bronson eradicates all of the bad guys before the sun comes up and doesn't wipe them off the screen. We'll do our best. I'm sure we'll have tons of canon trailers too in between each of the films like Harry likes to do. So tickets available at MahoningDIT.com. Until next time, I am Mark. Jeff is Jeff. Austin is Austin. And we will hope to see you at the drive-in. Jeff, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right-hand side of the screen at the front of the field, and most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night, and God bless you.